Hello, I'm Michael Teitelbaum from the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard uh, Law School. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a demographer. Labor and Work Life Program is very interested in the uh, careers of scientists and engineers, and that's what I have been writing about recently. First thing I want to say is that the research enterprise is a critical component of uh, the U.S. economy, very important leading edge of the economy, and of all developed countries, really. And in my humble opinion, biomedical research is the most exciting area of basic scientific research out there right now. But there are puzzles about the uh, biomedical research enterprise. It's one that is very heavily funded, massive budgets, and yet it sees itself as experiencing funding crises that seem to continue. And while it has the highest potential uh, in terms of research outcomes, it is presenting rather unattractive career prospects for recent entrants into the field. Well, where does U.S. Bio basic biomedical research fit in the world? It's very productive. It's been the world leader from World War II, and it is strengthening, not weakening. Uh, part of it was that the U.S. Uh, came out of World War II in much better shape than most other developed countries, but Part of it was very wise U.S. government policies, which facilitated the rise of basic research uh, to global leader. And this was particularly due to decisions by the government to increase the amount of funding provided for scientific research, but to direct the funding in the form of grants to research universities rather than to uh, uh, government research labs that would be built and would become uh, freestanding. And U.S. funding is very large. It is the highest level of funding of all large countries in the world, both in absolute terms or dollar terms, and as a percentage of the gross domestic product. And it represents about half of the total funding of all developed uh, countries. So it's large and import imposing. Unfortunately, there's also a long history of cycles in this funding, which I describe as uh, a cycle of alarm, boom, and bust in which the alarm is first sounded by somebody that uh, there's uh, a shortage of funding or the U.S. is falling behind its competitors, followed with a lag sometimes by government action to increase the support or the numbers of people in these fields, and then a loss of interest after a few years and uh, a bust in this system. And there have been five rounds, surprisingly, five rounds of alarm boom bust in scientific research and funding uh, since World War II. From World War II to 1957, first, that first round, that was mostly in physics. From 57, when Sputnik 1 was first launched, uh, to the 1970s. From 1981 to the early uh, 1990s, which was heavily related to the defense buildup under the Reagan administration. And then those were, as you can see, they were Cold War uh, kinds of uh, cycles followed by two cycles that were not Cold War related after the Cold War, the first having to do with high-tech industries booming uh, all together uh, in the uh, late 90s, and then all busting all together around 2001 and subsequently, and then an unrelated boom and bust in the biomedical research field, which had to do with funding for uh, National Institutes of Health from 1998, under the perception that there was a funding crisis uh, the political system agreed to double the budget of NIH in only a five-year period. That doubling was completed in 2003. The budget increases went from 14 or 15 percent a year to zero percent a year, and in, in some cases declined, and this led to a second crisis in funding, even though the budget was by then uh, almost twice as large as it had been only five or six years earlier. So this is a very successful system in research terms, but it's hardly a stable system, as you can see. And the core of the source of instability, in my view, is positive feedback that's built into the system. Nobody planned it that way, but it's there. If you increase research funding, automatically you will increase the number of slots for PhD students and postdocs who can be funded by the increased research funding. And that will happen even if there's no demand uh, increasing for PhDs after the 
uh, PhD and postdoc have been completed. Uh, at the same time, research budgets have grown, grant success rates have declined. And let me just show you, uh, I'll show you in a moment what that means. So let, let's first talk about the uh, positive feedback loop for PhDs and postdocs. Most of these PhD students and postdocs are funded as research assistants on research grants. And you see some numbers there from NSF and from NIH, which I think make that point. And then, as I said earlier, if you increase the research budget, you'll increase the number of PhDs and postdocs, even if there's no demand increasing, no perceived demand increase for PhDs and postdocs, who will then face weak career prospects. Now, aren't there negative feedback loops that are stabilizing as well? The answer is yes, there are. After all, talented U.S. students in these fields really do have alternatives. They can opt for other careers and other degrees in law, in business, in medicine. And those who've completed their uh, PhDs and postdocs and have started their research careers can shift out if they find the funding situation too unpleasant. But those are pretty destructive and uh, counterproductive uh, negative feedbacks. Uh, they, they, are, they are destructive to the system, not helpful to the system. And even if they take place, and they probably are taking place, the overall system still does not have to adjust uh, to the new reality because there is a large and increasing uh, international supply of PhD students and of postdocs who can be recruited and who can be supported financially under the U.S. research grant system. There are no limits on the number of such postdocs, uh, PhD students, and funding uh, under research grants. So here's a graph of the NIH uh, research budget from 1960 to 2012. I, I think you can see the, the dark bottom line is the absolute uh, or co current dollars unadjusted for inflation. The other two lines are different ways of adjusting for inflation. I, I think you can see what the trajectory has been. And the uh, rectangle, the red rectangle, shows you the period of the budget doubling for NIH when those lines went uh, very sharply upward. And then it's not been so great since. And one of the, this is a graph showing what's happened to the success rate with the increased funding curves you've just seen. Again, going back to the early 1960s. The blue line at the bottom is the number of research grants that have been supported financially. The red line is the number of proposals that have been submitted. And uh, if you compare those, you'll see what the green line is, which is the success rate of uh, submitted proposals to NIH, which has been in a downward trajectory pretty much since the 1960s, uh, with one major exception, a slight increase during the period of doubling outlined there as a rectangle. Now these booms and busts are not benign. They cause harm for PhDs and postdocs who are in a long period of study. Uh, they may enter at a time when career prospects are very promising and by the time they finish their career prospects may have waned through no uh, fault of their own. For research faculty they may begin their research careers and be very productive in their research output and yet find their careers disrupted because funding suddenly becomes less possible to obtain. And universities are given incentives to leverage up, to, to take on more risk by the current structure. They can pay more salaries of their faculty uh, from uh, research grant funding and they can take on more debt and they're encouraged to take on more debt to build new facilities or remodel labs uh, because they can claim uh, the costs of those labs from their indirect grant support. And they are certainly incentivized to hire or recruit more PhDs and postdocs as research assistants as the lab, the bench lab workforce for these grant supported activities. If their assumptions about future budget growth, though, turn out not to be right, they will find themselves exposed to greater risk uh, and even financial crises. And that is happening now at many U.S. universities. This is an article I published in 2008 about this system, 
I said I hoped I would be wrong. Unfortunately, I was not wrong, and uh, things have gotten worse since. Okay, so how does all this fit in with the claims I'm sure you've all heard about there being serious general shortages of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, professionals in the U.S. workforce? Absolutely standard fare in American political discussions in the mass media, though not in the specialist media, which knows better. Researchers who have looked at this question uh, have been able to find no credible evidence of these general shortages that are standard fare. Instead, what they find is, while there are no general shortages, you can find huge variation by field, by time, uh, by degree level, and by geography. And most of the uh, claims of shortages come out of the IT sector and especially from Silicon Valley. And these are just very atypical, very erratic kinds of industries with their own massive booms and busts and very high housing costs that have to be uh, supported uh, in Silicon Valley. So generalizing from Silicon Valley experience is a really bad idea. However, the shortage claims are uh, supported and continue because those involved know that they work at the political level. And there's very heavy financing of lobbying and campaign finance from those industries to make the claim that there are shortages of STEM workers. Meanwhile, on the biomedical research side, the leaders of biomedical research have been, in recent years, have been um, leading. Uh, the uh, director of the National Institute of, Institutes of Health, Francis Collins, commissioned a report on the biomedical research workforce by a task force of his advisory committee to the director. And I commend that report to you. It's on the NIH website, and you should read it because it's actually a very good piece of work. And then more recently, a group of distinguished uh, biomedical researchers who have come to be called the Quartet have taken a leadership role by publishing these two articles at the bottom here in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. You can see in that picture Shirley Tillman, the former president of Princeton University, Bruce Alberts, former president of the National Academies, Harold Varmus, the former director of NIH and of NCI, and Mark Kirshner, a distinguished researcher at Harvard Medical School. And they've taken a leadership role, which is very positive. It's healthy because this kind of leadership is the best kind of leadership. People like this can, uh, can most effectively identify what stabilizers might be considered and which would uh, minimize any damage to what is, as I said earlier, a very productive research system. And it also shows that senior scientists in biomedical research are really concerned about early career scientists. They're doing fine themselves, but they are worried about the early career scientists. Here I'm including uh, uh, PIs and university leaders, the National Academies, NIH leadership, etc. The young investigators, the early career investigators, are their intellectual progeny, and they know they're the future leaders of biomedical research. So let me close with three possible stabilizers that ought to be discussed and considered in my view. First, find ways to reduce that positive feedback that I discussed earlier. That would mean really allocating more support to PhD students and postdocs as trainees rather than as research assistants. Not more altogether. There's no need to grow the number, but shift the proportion from what is now very high percentage as research assistants back down to, say, half and half for trainees and research assistants. Second, to seek to grow the budgets for research and development, but to do so in a steady, steady way, in a steadier way, a more predictable way, it would require uh, biomedical researchers and their leaders to actually oppose any proposals for booming increases in funding for additional doublings that might be proposed, these have turned out to be destabilizing. And the way I would put it is, be careful what you wish for. But also to support longer term budget plans that do have sustained and sustainable budget growth, such as a five year trajectory as proposed by the quartet. And finally, we really need to understand this system better. It's a critical system for the future. We have very weak data. For example, we don't even know to a factor of two how many postdocs 
there are in the United States right now. It's sort of shocking when you think about it. And we need to have better research on the critical system that we're talking about and the way it's working and what problems it faces and how those might be mitigated. Thank you for your attention. That's the end of what I have to say. <laughs>